views expressed in this program are those of the participants. Air Control 1 to Vessel Able Baker 4. Traffic Control Law. Approach Inner City on Corridor 34. What is your current position in your fuel supply? Houston Control, this is Flight 711. Come in, Houston Control. Put on your cars, you'll be back, gammon boards. Lucky Buck is back. Houston Control, this is Flight 711. Come on, you guys, you read me? Give me some instructions. I'm on final re entry. Come in, Houston Control. Houston Control, do you read me? Hey, come on, you turkeys, get off your duffs and give me some info. Practically a foreign language. Can it be some kind of joke? I have target and visual sight. What is it? Hey, all right. Nice seeing you. Guys. Attention, alien spacecraft. Do you read? I'm not sure you call an alien. You don't look so familiar yourself, you know. Who are you? Please restrict your answers to yes and no. You are in grave danger. From who? You? You are traversing a narrow corridor into our inner cities. Inner what? Look, lady. Colonel Deering, now please be quiet. If you deviate from my orders by so much as a thousand yards, you will be burned into vapors. Do you understand? Vapors? Yeah, yeah, I understand. What do I do? Do you have manual override capabilities? Sure. Then follow me very closely. Be right on your tail. We really blew it this time. Gotta be the Russians. You're doing just fine. Das Vidania. I beg your pardon? I'm just trying to be friendly. Violating our airspace is an act of war, not friendship. I don't know the guys to cape here this. Buck Rogers sits down in the middle of Red Square. Welcome everyone. It is Thursday, February the 28th, 2019. I'm Bob Metz, and this is Just Right, broadcasting around the world and online. Join us for an hour of discussion that's not right wing. It's Just Right. Fade into color, color into black and white. Under the bedclothes, everything will be well, it's always nice to know that we can blame the Russians <laughs> for anything that can't be readily explained, whether yesterday, today, or 400 years from now in the science fiction world of Buck Rogers in the 25th century. A great TV show, by the way, originally made when the world of Buck Rogers was 500 years away. <laughs> of course, Buck didn't land in Red Square, but he believed that because he was operating on fake assumptions. And of course, Donald Trump didn't get elected because of Russian meddling, because that's just fake news. On today's show, I'd like to clean up some loose ends regarding a few of our recent broadcasts. This concerns, among others, the issues of fake news, amber alerts, the so-called political spectrum of left and right, something we're always discussing because it strikes at the heart of epistemology, where the power of thought and politics originates, and a few others if we have time to get to them. I'm doing this thanks mostly to some feedback we received from a few of our listeners who made some very interesting observations and asked some very fundamental questions that perhaps I have really not addressed directly before. So before we get underway, don't forget, you can always write us at feedback at justrightmedia.org. Subscribe to Just Right on iTunes and follow us on SoundCloud. Hear us on WBCQ and on Channel 292 Shortwave. Visit us at www.justrightmedia.org, where you can access all of Just Right's social media links, our archive broadcasts, and of course, where we encourage you to visit to offer your financial support. And coincidentally enough, that very request speaks in many ways to our show theme and subject today. In fact, Robert Vaughn actually encouraged me to encourage you to really give some serious thought to supporting this show with your financial donations. No, we're not a charity, and we don't offer tax credits or receipts for your support. What you do get for your contributions is this show and all of the other Just Right Media content available online. And of course, you'll also know that by doing so, you'll become an active, not a passive, part of our effort to enlighten others about the true nature of freedom and capitalism in a world desperately in need of both. So before I run out of time or forget to do it, let me right now make a point of thanking some of you who have already financially supported Just Right. Now, we don't read last names on the air without prior consent, 
But I won't let that stop me, on behalf of the whole Just Right team, from thanking, in basic alphabetic order, David B., Paul B., Todd D., Earl G., Bjorn L., Dennis N., Mike P., Jacob P., Gary P., Liam T., and Murray T. for their financial support, the support that makes this show possible. And if you're wondering why you should financially support Just Right, perhaps today's feedback and our responses might offer a few meaningful insights into your consideration. Now, of course, from this side of the microphone, or camera as the case increasingly may be, Just Right, as you may know, is growing. And we're experiencing those inevitable growing pains associated with the need for increased and steady financial resources to enable it all to happen. As we discussed earlier in the year, beginning in January, we expanded our presence on shortwave, and we're now continuing our efforts to expand on other platforms, most notably YouTube, where Danielle and Robert posted their first YouTube version of the Danielle Metz show this past Sunday. So I know that you're probably feeling inundated by financial appeals from dozens of your favorite podcasters, bloggers, and others asking for your support, and you may find it all rather intimidating. The need is perpetual, and sometimes it seems overwhelming. Or maybe you're thinking that podcasts and podcasters aren't as significant or as important as supporting all of the charities and other special causes also vying for your financial support. Now I get that. Priorities. But even as an online podcaster myself, I've supported other podcasters and YouTube content providers, both financially and by encouraging our own listeners to support those other content providers by visiting their sites and contributing to their efforts. I mean, after all, from my point of view, a lot of their efforts provide us with fuel for our efforts, thanks to their hands-on research, guests, or commentaries with which we may or may not agree. I'm thinking about folks like, say, and here's just a small list, Ben Shapiro, Ezra Levant in the Rebel Media, Stephen Crowder, you know, Louder with Crowder, Prager U, Faith Goldie, Bill Whittle in the Right Angle Team, Stefan Molyneux, Candace Owens, Sargon of Akkad, who's Carl Benjamin, Dave Cullen, Kathy Shadle, Matt Christensen, Dave Rubin, Paul Joseph Watson, Pat Condell, Janice Fiamengo, Andrew Lawton, Tommy Robinson, Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, Andrew Clavin, The Amazing Lucas, Count Dankula, Frank Vaughn, Gad Sad. All of these people are deserving of your support. And by the way, <laughs> four of the people I just mentioned have appeared on Just Right, but I'll leave it to you to guess which ones. Now, for the most part, I've publicly agreed with selected commentaries or opinions from these content producers, but not too infrequently, I find myself diametrically opposed to something someone from this group may have argued. So it's easy to lose sight of what the bigger picture is all about and what these people all share in common. And that is that they're all considered to be voices on the right. The other thing that these folks share in common is that they are, for the most part, private individuals who, to the horror of the left and establishment, are having a serious impact on resisting all the BS and the fake news coming out of mainstream media and government. And that's why their very existence is continually being threatened by the leftists who often own or control the platforms on which their content is stored and made available to the public. Meanwhile, the voices of the left get the financial support of government and special interest groups looking for favors from government to mention a few. The voices of the left are allowed to express opinions online that, if similar opinions were expressed by the right, would be subject to some form of online banishment or denial of access, as we've heard so often in the recent past. So if what's right matters to you, you should make every effort to financially support all of your favorites if you can, but there's no need to let it overwhelm you either financially or psychologically. Now among all those voices on the right I just mentioned, just right is unique in one key respect. And that difference is explained and enunciated in the very name of this show, Just Right. And in our opener to the show, which has remained steadfast since the very beginning. Not right wing, just right. And that too is something I'll be expanding on a little later on. 
On another point of note about this show, you may from time to time hear an audio bite excerpted from another podcaster or another TV show or movie that we maybe did not cite the source of during our broadcast. So if you ever want to check out the source of our audio bites, including our drama openers and our comedy closers, you can always go to the Relevant Show's blog post online and click on the associated Clips and Credits button at the bottom of that post. You might even discover some different TV shows or movies that you could end up watching for your own enjoyment. And of course, we also have a YouTube channel with content completely separate from what you might hear on this show and even other past radio broadcasts and podcasts quite different from Just Right. Thousands of selections. Most timeless in terms of the principles discussed, all available to anyone at the push of a button with no cost attached. And that's just part of what you're supporting when you make a donation to Just Right Media. So once again, give it your consideration. Visit www.justrightmedia.org to make that donation, or go directly to paypal.me slash justrightmedia. It's as simple as that. Give a one-time donation or sign up for regular monthly donations through PayPal. Every donation in any amount is appreciated, and if you ever want to know how your donations are put to use, just tune in to our weekly broadcasts of Just Right, and maybe, if you haven't done so already, take an exploratory trip around our site, and you just might be pleasantly surprised by some of the other features you will discover. Now, got this one from Josh M. via a private Twitter message to Robert Vaughn, who in turn forwarded it to me. Quote, Hey buddy, I gotta thank you guys for that last episode of Just Right. For me, it was both hugely satisfying and enlightening. Thing is, it's like there's been this weird smell in the air ever since 2016 when I started hearing about Russian meddling, quote-unquote. It bothered me that this was the only word I ever read in relation to the situation. Every paper, every article, they only said meddling. It's been scratching at my brain for years until today. So I'm grateful for the breakdown you put together. The only problem is that I felt this confusing itch in my head morph into a twisting slipknot in my guts. I feel very weird about it now, and I'm trying to fight off the sense of doom it left me with. What are your thoughts on this? I can't decide if it's an overreaction on my part to feel this way. I feel embarrassed that I kept pushing that feeling back into my subconscious without really examining it. Sorry if I darkened your day. I just felt the need to tell you how much that last show meant to me. It clicked all the tumblers down and blew the doors open on things I've been blind to for so long. Thanks, and give my warmest regards to Bob Metz as well. Keep it up, brother. End quote. Well, thank you, Josh. Robert did pass on your regards, which in turn inspired today's show theme. Josh's comments came in response to our show two weeks ago, just right in 595, which we broadcast on February 14th, when our entire focus was on fake views about fake news. And if you haven't heard it yet yourself, I strongly urge you to check it out and be sure to share it with anyone who you think might be receptive. It was an enlightenment for me as well, particularly as we discovered the objective truth about how planned and consciously carried out the whole fake news propaganda campaign against Donald Trump was launched and continues to this day. And it's another example of why shows like this one should be supported by anyone who wants to see the fakers called out for what they are. So to Josh, who's concerned that he may have darkened my day, let me turn that concern back on you, Josh, because your comments suggest that it was more like I'm the one who darkened your day. But I understand exactly what you're referring to. Learning the verifiable truth and the facts about how completely unconcerned with truth or facts so many of our leading elected representatives actually are. It certainly is a portent of darker days ahead. Hence that sense of doom. You know, your feelings are not unfounded and I share them. Come to think of it, maybe you did darken my day. (laughs) In fact... You've addressed an issue and concern that cannot simply be answered in a few sentences. So my hope is that by the end of today's broadcast, both of our days will be somewhat brightened as we proceed to address some of the observations and questions from other listeners, like Frank G., 
who wrote to ask us this, quote, Have you ever asked yourself why it is that an ordinary citizen who makes a public, non-political, calm, logical, impersonal comment on some matter of public policy is instantly dubbed right-wing? Will someone please enlighten me? What does right-wing mean? Thanks, Frank. Well, I'm not too sure if it's possible to make a non-political comment on a matter of public policy, but that's an irrelevant consideration with respect to your essential question. Actually, you, had, you asked two questions. One, why the label? And two, what does the label mean? Well, first, why? Because the term right-wing is intended as a pejorative, as an insult, as a way of dismissing any comment on public policy that's not left-wing. The term right-wing is, quite incorrectly, though intentionally, associated with racism, fascism, Nazism, and the like, all intended to close the conversation or to avoid having to address the so-called right-wing comment. After all, right-wingers are not worthy of consideration. But of course, all those things they associate the right with are really on the left. But the irony of all this, of course, is that the vast majority of people who use the terms left and right have absolutely no idea of what they're talking about, or worse, have the wrong idea. You know, they fall into that trap of knowing things that just ain't so, as we like to point out from time to time. Which brings us to your second question. What does right-wing mean? And this question is so important so essential to understanding anything about politics, it cannot be understated. Many even refuse to use either left or right as identifiers anymore, thanks to the successful epistemological campaign by those on the left, who do not want to have their true nature revealed. Left and right are what lie at the base of true identity politics, where identities are not based on race, gender, color, or the group someone's associated with, but with the color of the ideas that drive all of their political motivations. For a thorough and in-depth analysis to the history and application of these political labels, I would refer you to Just Right 510, compassing the political spectrum left and right, which was originally broadcast on June 22, 2017. But here's the basics, and we should review it. You know, in traditional scales and diagrams illustrating the political spectrum, most people have been taught that the political gradients from left to right, you know, go from radical, liberal, centrist, conservative, reactionary, and you have communism on the left and fascism on the right at the extreme ends. But both in theory and practice, these ideological representations and others like them are completely wrong. They do not reflect political reality and demonstrably so yet they continue to be taught in our schools and used as a standard method of contrasting the political spectrum, so-called. The traditional political spectrum that I just described is, in fact, a spectrum of the political left only. If you change the word right on that diagram where right sits on the right, change it to left, and only then will the diagram make sense. Because glaringly absent from traditional political diagrams are, of course, the words freedom and capitalism. Since by definition, left and right are intended to be polar opposites, a more accurate, simple, and useful representation of the political polarities would be simply on the left you have tyranny and on the right you have freedom. Those are the conditions that you will find at the end of those chains. Because the right represents freedom, which is kind of a natural condition in comparison to the unlimited number of freedom restricting ideologies, the political right is almost not political at all. In fact, the political right would be best described generically, as we have done. And this is a great definition of what we mean when we say that we're just right. And I got this right out of the dictionary, Funk and Wagnalls. Six points. One, done in accordance with or conformable to moral law or to some standard of rightness. Equitable, just, righteous. Number two, conformable to truth or fact. Number three, conformable to a standard of propriety or to the conditions of the case, proper, fit, suitable. Number four, holding one direction as a line, straight, direct. Number five, properly placed, disposed or adjusted, well-regulated, orderly. And number six, sound in mind or body, healthy, well. Now, 
You know, there's no corresponding generic definition of left in standard dictionaries. So a simple way to objectively describe the political left would be to use the exact opposite of the six right principles I just described. Here's the six points. One, done in opposition to or unconformable to moral law or standard of rightness. Because, of course, then it would be leftness. (laughs) Inequitable, unjust, self-righteous. Number two unconformable to truth or fact. Fake. Number three, unconformable to any standard of propriety or to the conditions of the case. Improper, unfit, unsuitable. Number four, moving in every direction as a circle. Crooked, indirect, misleading. Number five, improperly placed, indisposed or maladjusted, unregulated, chaotic. Number six, unsound in mind or body, unhealthy, and sick. A couple other observations I had about left and right. On the right is freedom and capitalism, of course. Freedom is the condition that serves the general interest and not the special interest, whereas tyranny, on the other side, obviously serves the interest of the tyrant at the expense of the general interest. But it's important to keep in mind that left and right are polarized and binary concepts. Concepts that relate to ideas and ideologies only. And that means there's only two options available. There's no middle of the road or centrist position. And up and down are not opposites to left and right and backwards and forwards and all that. It's just left and right. But left wing and right wing are not polarized, nor are they binary. The winged versions of left and right are relative. They're relative to one common body or ideology. Left and right wing are meaningless without this essential context. But it's just like a bird or a bat with wings, okay? Although birds have both a left and a right wing, both wings are going in the same direction as the bird. And as wings, they are incapable of heading in any opposite directions, right? The more accurate labels describing people in a political context are those non-left and right words, liberal, centrist, conservative, reactionary, among others. Now, another very important thing to realize about left and right, and this gets down to the psychology and the fundamental operation of the human mind in this sense, and that is that the left refers to the primacy of consciousness. People on the left operate on the primacy of consciousness, the right on the primacy of existence. But the idea that words, which represent concepts about the real world, can be subjectively and variably interpreted, is not only false, but exceedingly dangerous. It's a root cause of much of the strife in the world today. Nowhere can this be seen more clearly than in the world of politics, where the very term identity politics has come to mean a concealment or misrepresentation of identity. Among the words most misunderstood in the political lexicon are those used most often. Left, right, conservative, liberal, communism, fascism, capitalism, socialism, to name but a few. Having never clearly defined these words since they were first used, there's been a massive failure in the ability to identify political ideologies and their consequences when put into action. The political identity crisis has now been expanded into all fields of human discourse, including sexuality, where it has now become politically acceptable to deny one's sexual identity and to declare it to be something that it is not. Words improperly used and applied lead to a disconnect from reality and can fuel everything from political conflict to mental disorders to social dysfunction. And boy, are we going to hear a lot of that later in the show. As philosopher-novelist Ayn Rand explained, the primacy of existence, of reality, is the axiom that existence exists, that the universe exists independent of consciousness or of any consciousness, that things are what they are, that they possess a specific nature, an identity. The epistemological corollary is the axiom that consciousness is the faculty of perceiving that which exists and that man gains knowledge of reality by looking outward. The rejection of these axioms represents a reversal, the primacy of consciousness, the notion that the universe has no independent existence, that it is the product of a consciousness, either human or divine or both. 
The epistemological corollary is the notion that man gains knowledge of reality by looking inward, either at his own consciousness or at the revelations it receives from another superior consciousness. The source of this reversal is the inability or unwillingness fully to grasp the difference between one's inner state and the outer world. Properly defined, the right side of the political polarity operates on the philosophic premise of the primacy of existence. Leftists want to flood the world with false concepts. So the primacy of consciousness, I think, is the primary cause of the left's intellectual and emotional dysfunction. On the return side of our next bumper, we'll be hearing an excerpt from an August 15, 2018 commentary by Paul Joseph Watson on this very dysfunction, while on this side of our bumper, from the Daily Caller News Foundation, we are provided with a few examples. Every person is afraid of that hat. I'm afraid of that hat. As a human being, you should pay attention to fear and not logic. Wait, wait, you said pay attention to fear and not logic? Yes. I should have paid attention to emotions and not facts? Yes. Stop f***ing you to say what's this? Facts are facts. Are facts. No, emotions are real. Emotions no, is one removed from spirit. It has to be a joke. I do not believe this is happening. I'm literally about to f***ing kill myself and I'm not kidding. You better f***ing fix this sh- right now. I literally am gonna die. I need an ambulance. Right here on the Western Washington campus, she's going nuts with the Trump sign. With the Trump sign. Oh. And <laughs> in her lifetime, she deserves to be the first female president. And that's what makes me so sad. I need Hillary to stand up right now and walk in and sue the United States of America. Women need you. Minorities need you. I need you. Chicago needs you. We all need you. This country needs you to stand up and walk into the Supreme Court and say one vote equals one vote. What's wrong with that? What's the debate? Just... I think I'm going to have to hand this off. Yeah. And then I was like, no, this isn't right. It's just not right. So many people have expressed to me personally across the country at my shows, they're scared. So, yeah, I don't know what's... I don't know if I'm going to get arrested today. There's a bunch of old white guys trying to silence me, and I'm just here to say that's wrong. Hmm. Can we put up the graphic of this? Excuse me, it's ma'am. It is ma'am. Right beforehand, you said sir. Mother take it outside. If you want to call me sir again, I will show you sir. Mother Sorry. That doesn't for us tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow. No, it's if you're a whole mother No, 50 50, man. Oh, oh, I off you. I'm not a Nazi. What are you doing, man? Hey, hey. hey. Whoa! You got a problem? Yeah, I got a f***ing problem. You want to fight me? I hate Ted Cruz! I hate Ted Cruz! I hate Ted Cruz! I hate Ted Cruz! You better f***ing fix this sh** right now! It is me! Oh, we should go now. 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 Emotional incontinence. You have urinary incontinence. No, I said emotional incontinence. Sorry, I hate f***ing crying. As Western civilization collapses, 
which it is, so does our ability to deal with minor day-to-day -day struggles, without breaking down and wallowing in a pitiful puddle of our own self-indulgent fragility. We're indoctrinated with emotional incontinence by television. America has been collectively turned into Kim Kardashian's cry face. I've just been like so unhappy. She don't think I feel bad. The masses overdose on reality TV, thinking that it's actually reality and then mimic it in their own lives. The more insipid sentimentality displayed on TV, the more it manifests itself in the here and now. Vacuous people live their lives vicariously through celebrities and television, then base their own personalities on that. Reality TV doesn't reflect reality. It contrives reality. It relentlessly broadcasts the message that ostentatious OTT, often dumb, displays of emotion are to be imitated. The same is true of YouTube. YouTubers are rewarded for emotional incontinence and oversharing. The try not to cry challenge. Constantly crying and whining about their drama and their breakups. The viewers lap it up like water in the desert. Floodgates of emotional incontinence are also flung open whenever a celebrity dies. Why do people whimper and sob over dead celebrities they never knew? and in many cases rarely even thought about until they died. Does this betray another form of weakness? Our inability to process the concept of death itself. Are mass public outpourings of grief and canonization of dead celebrities a sign that humanity has never been more afraid? of its own mortality. A sign that excessive emoting is making us both more insecure and more insincere. As Theodore Dalrymple wrote, we live in an age of emotional incontinence when they who emote the most are believed to feel the most. And I'm not saying you should never cry or express emotion, especially people who have experienced real trauma and have PTSD like injured war veterans or female rape victims. But please, save it for something that actually deserves that response. Dalrymple again, where once emotional restraint and self-control were admired, now it's emotional incontinence that the British aim for. It's as if they had undergone potty training in reverse. Society's endorsement of emotional incontinence is training us to behave like we have a mental disorder. Seriously, it's a mental disorder. Why are we being convinced to embrace mental illness? Because it's easier to control and coerce a population that's permanently trapped in a heightened state of emotional frailty than one that has a strong cerebral constitution. Because the people who can't control their own disposition then become control freaks themselves. If people can't control their own emotions, then they have to start trying to control other people's behavior. I know what you're thinking. Paul, you're just a heartless, miserable bastard. Yeah, and? <laughs> I simply am not there. Actually, no. I'm a stoic. I'm not making all this stuff up off the top of my head. I'm not regurgitating some stereotypical stiff upper lip basic bitchery. This is called Stoicism, a branch of philosophy that stretches back to the third century BC. Stoicism is the antidote to emotional incontinence. Stoicism is a realistic alternative to nihilism. You know, hearing leftists <laughs> who love Hillary Clinton and hate Trump scream, emotions trump facts, do they not hear themselves how, what, a, what a contradiction and irony that is? Isn't it always the Democrats <laughs> who are calling for fact-checking every time Donald Trump utters a word? Do those facts not matter to these emotional supporters of the Democrats? <laughs> Obviously, the emotionally crippled are also intellectually crippled. And you have to ask yourself, and I don't mean this as sarcasm, but as a serious definition, are they even human anymore? What is, the, I mean, this dysfunction is, is, is incredibly dangerous. Now, the idea of emotional incontinence is nothing new, the one brought up there by Paul Joseph Watson. As we've reviewed on past episodes, Willem Reich, back in the pre-World War II days, in his mass psychology of fascism, identified the same phenomenon, one that he associated with the growth of fascism in Germany during his time, and he called it the emotional plague. 
Doesn't that sound similar to the quote we just heard? Quote, if people can't control their own emotions, then they have to start trying to control other people's behavior, end quote. And that's the source of fascism. So something to keep in mind there, and we'll get back to that shortly. But not before dealing with this letter that we got from Andrew B., whose letter, by the way, I shared with you on last week's show, a listener who works in the ER of his local hospital. And he wrote, quote, Hey, Robert, saying thanks here for reading my letter on that recent episode of Just Right. A pleasant surprise. I think you're right about the topic of Amber Alert's issue being about virtue signaling above all else. I hadn't considered that. But I forgot I'd mentioned that anecdote about my observation and participation in successful resuscitation, and I thought it provided an example of the way a centralized emergency response system can successfully work versus the whole Amber Alert idea. I'm not too sure if the contrast was intentional or not. For instance, you mentioned that you didn't have a problem with inconvenience if it can actually lead to a demonstrable benefit, i.e. saving lives. For, for instance, we have laws that enforce the right of way for emergency vehicles. It might be inconvenient to have to pull over to allow an ambulance through, but it's a small inconvenience when it comes to the grave situations of life or limb. By contrast, the level of interruption with Amber Alerts the late-night texts and alarms going off at home while dozing off to bed seems overly intrusive relative to the degree of impact on actually saving a life, end quote. Well, what a great example you picked, Andrew, to illustrate the distinction and the principle of a socially acceptable inconvenience. But I'll take it a point further. Now, if I was going to create an Amber Alert parallel <laughs> to your example of right-of-way for emergency vehicles, well, then the Amber Alert system would force everyone in the whole city to pull over, <laughs> not just the people who are in the way of the ambulance. You see the, you see the comparison? <laughs> now, personally, I think that the Amber Alert systems primarily appeal to emotional incontinence. And that's what we heard last week on the show. Remember the emotional reaction we cited when a supporter of the Amber Alert said, quote, Anyone who called 911 to complain should be publicly named and shamed. What's wrong with people? Suppose it was their child. We challenge you to do something kind for someone, end quote. And it was just a complete emotional breakdown and unrelated to the plight of the abducted child, who, by the way, as you know, was found murdered by her father. And since our show last week, for those who haven't heard, the father has also passed away from his self-inflicted wounds. Interestingly, regarding the Amber Alert, I ran into this article from Post Media News written by Trevor Turfloth. Chatham 911 dispatcher facing probe after Amber Alert Twitter tantrum. And I'll just cite part of it because it speaks to the whole hypocrisy behind this whole promotion of an Amber Alert by our authorities. Quote, a civilian 911 dispatcher in Chatham, Kent, is facing an internal investigation after a critical tweet was posted about last week's Amber Alert about a missing 11-year-old Brampton girl later found dead. The late-night alert Thursday, broadcast on TV and fanned out on cell phones, provoked a backlash among many people, dozens of whom called 911 to complain in Peel region where the girl lived. Others vented 911 calls elsewhere in the province and reportedly as far afield as Winnipeg. Police across Ontario expressed dismay at the reaction. Even Prime Minister Justin Trudeau weighed in, tweeting such alerts, quote, are critically important to helping police when a child's life is on the line, end quote. A tweet posted to the account of Brian French, a civilian employee of the Chatham-Kent Emergency Communications Center, said, now get this, quote, Emergency alert just scared the crap out of me. Suspect heading eastbound from Brampton? Um, I'm three hours west of Brampton. Idiots, how do I turn this, expletive, emergency alert off? End quote. And French is an employee of the Chatham-Kent police. The tweet was later deleted, but not before it hit the media. <laughs> On social media, some people complained they were still getting the alerts early last Friday after the initial alert and its cancellation had been posted. 
Again, the public has been implored to support such alerts. And, and as I pointed out last week, nobody's opposed to the alerts. What they're opposed to is being terrified and offended by the takeover of their own private property and having to be woken in the middle of the night and then being judged as, you know, being immoral for their reactions. Interesting observation, too. My sister Kathy <laughs> told me something very interesting about the Amber Alert. When, on our show last week, we featured a news audio bite in which the sound of the Amber Alert was heard, as she was listening to this show, as soon as that Amber Alert started sounding, her cat went rangy, totally freaked out. So you might want to know, human beings are not alone in the way they reacted to the Amber Alert. And by the way, that dispatcher's comment, how do I turn this expletive emergency alert off, speaks to an issue that I didn't really get into in a big way last week. For a lot of people, as I've learned since, when the Amber Alert went out, it cut off the ability of them to use the device over which it was broadcast, including their smartphones, TV sets, and other devices. Now think about that for a minute. Hope to hell you don't need to dial 911 yourself at the same moment as an Amber Alert is issued. Will your phone even work? I don't know. Not if you don't know how to turn off the offensive sound effects and end the Amber Alert before they finish with it. You know, as I mentioned last week, when an Amber Alert sounded during an AM radio show I was listening to, this was a previous one, I had to turn the radio off immediately, as quickly as I could. It was horrible. And that ended my radio listening for that day. But this notion that our being offended by an offensive alert is about our not caring about the plight of a missing child is sheer nonsense and has nothing to do with the virtue signaling or fear-mongering that these alerts really represent. As we learned last week from some official research, it's all about crime theater. You're going to die, every last one of you. I'm sorry to give you the bad news, but that's a fact. Death, sooner or later. Show me those dials. Now the woman sitting next to the man in the check suit, spread out, give yourself some living space. If we wanted you next to each other, we'd fill this hall and I'd make another hundred thousand, but you wouldn't get the point, and the point is, take control. Take control of your own space, your own lives, your own responses. We don't want you crammed in, contaminating each other with your nasty little fears and insecurities and if you don't think that you're that kind of a girl or that kind of a boy then what are you doing here shoveling out your hard-earned money to the good doctor <laughs> now did anybody forget to twist these dial no. no oh come on i can't hear that no dr mason no dr mason good charlie how did they do on the word death they didn't like death. Negative 8 dB on that one. Thank you, Charlie. You're not really sure what death means, but you don't like it. You don't like the word. You're bothered by the word mother. You're afraid of the word father. Words! Food, money, boss, wife, sex. Mommy and Daddy started setting you up right from the cradle, conditioning you. They took control with the control words. Then the words took control. Now who's got the control? I've got the control. The words lock you into your locked up little lives. Now we're going to teach you how to smash the lock. Do you think we could find one single word that dominates your life, Lieutenant? Well, now that you put it that way, sir, I suppose there is one. Then say the word. Murder. Oh, well, that's simple enough. Your work dominates everything. Doesn't everyone, sir? Only a fortunate few. Now, I'm going to say a word. And you tell me the first word that comes into your mind, then I'll say another word, and so on. Murder. Dogs. Justice. Work. Mother. Father. Father. Win. Pain. Fail. Murder. Word. I'd say you had a wholesome enough childhood. 
And you're something of an overachiever, Lieutenant. But how did we get from murder to word? Well, it's those dogs, sir. I keep coming back to them, how maybe there's some kind of a signal. Some kind of a special attack word that the dogs will respond to. But then the dogs would have to be trained. The worst of it is, if someone did train the dogs, they could dangle that word right in front of me and I wouldn't even recognize it. But the dogs would, according to your theory. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, the dogs would certainly react to the word. May we play the game again? Sorry, the game? The word game. Only this time, I'll start. Money. Uh, work. Work. Teach. Elephant. Tusk. Wolf. Dog. Dog. Kill. Kill. Charlie. Wife. Love. Animal. Hunt. Trap. Word game. You're listening to Just Right, broadcasting around the world and online. And word games strike at the heart of the game of politics because it's all about epistemology and the proper association of the proper words with the right concepts. So in that context, beware of the politics of adjectives. Don't get tangled up in what I call the Gordian knot of politics, and I spell that with an N-O-T, not a K-N-O-T. According to Wikipedia, the original Gordian knot is a legend of Phrygian Gordium associated with Alexander the Great. It is often used as a metaphor for an intractable problem, untying an impossibly tangled knot, solved easily by finding an approach to the problem that renders the perceived constraints of the problem moot. (laughs) Cutting the Gordian knot, we've heard that. And apparently, according to one legend, the knot was resolved by simply taking a sword to it. (laughs) But our own epistemological Gordian knot, N-O-T, of politics can only be cut by dropping the adjectives. Now, we've long argued on this show that when certain adjectives are placed in front of a given word, particularly political concepts, that adjective usually means not. For example, let's go through a few. Social justice, that means not justice. Social enterprise, that means not enterprise. Matter of fact, you can put social in front of almost anything and it's not what it is. Alt-right, not right. In fact, the alternative to right is left. (laughs) Neoconservative and neoliberal, not conservative and not liberal. Social media, not media. In fact, that was one of the key points raised in our show two weeks ago. This related directly to our theme of fake views about fake news. Come to think of it, fake news? Not news. (laughs) New Democrat. Not Democrat. Just socialist. Here's an interesting one. Direct democracy. Not democracy. In fact, it's mob rule. And that's what a lot of people are calling for. Here's another one. Proportional representation. Well, that's not representation. Think about it. Imagine if you hired a lawyer and you only received proportional representation for your case in court. Yes, Your Honor, I'm absolutely innocent of this murder charge, but you know, the other side has a really good case worth hearing. (laughs) Oh, man. Employment equity. That's not equity because you're treating people differently because of their unequal qualities. Therefore, you have to believe that they're already unequal before making them equal can even be considered. But here is a really tricky one. you got to watch out for this one. Just last week, I heard an AM talk show radio host ask this question. Quote, Is there such a thing as reverse discrimination? And suddenly, a whole new side of the Gordian knot principle came into view. Talk about a loaded epistemological twist. Think about it. In this case, with the term reverse discrimination, the word reverse is intended to mean not, but it doesn't. (laughs) Wow. Reverse discrimination is still discrimination. It's almost like a double negative. 
So what they're trying to do in terms of a positive spin is they're trying to say it's not really discrimination. I mean, that's the intended positive spin. But of course, it's not not really discrimination, is it? Talk about false words associations and double... <laughs> Do you and I share the same goals? If we do, we can disagree, even strongly disagree, and still have a productive discussion. We might even reach a compromise. But if we don't share the same goals, then what? Then, rhetorically speaking, we're at war, and only one side can win. Let me explain. My parents and brother lean more to the liberal side of the political spectrum than I do. We argue, we slightly nudge each other, we change opinions a little bit, and then we go back to Scrabble. They were very upset when President Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Accords. I was happy. We argued about it, but it was all good because we share the same goals. We all want clean air and water for our children. We all want to develop clean energy. We want America's economy to prosper. We want to be less reliant on fossil fuels. I thought the Accords were a bad deal for America. The best way to lower carbon emissions, in my opinion, is to let the free market and American ingenuity loose on the problem. They, in contrast, think the government needs to step in, fund the research, and keep the corporations in line. Doesn't matter, because we have the same goal, a healthy planet. We also disagree on gun control. My brother's a little more with me, but my dad wants a lot more regulation because he wants fewer school shootings. So do I. So does my brother. But I believe if a potential killer knew he'd encounter teachers and administrators well-trained in the use of weapons, we'd have less shootings. Different solutions, shared goal. I've always thought this is how America is supposed to work. Liberals and conservatives respectfully arguing over the best solution to a shared goal. But now there's a third party in the game, the left. And they're changing the rules. When I was growing up, the left was on the fringe but now they've moved into the mainstream. They've pretty much taken over our educational system. They're in the media, in corporate HR departments, and more and more, sad to say, in the Democratic Party. The left doesn't share the same goals that liberals and conservatives do. They have a whole different set of goals. Let me give you some examples. Raising kids without a gender identity or encouraging them to question their sexual identity, this to me is a form of child abuse. I don't care who's doing it, parents, teachers, doctors. Their goal is not my goal. Here's another one. Demonizing white people and males for the world's problems is not part of my value system. There is no shared goal in that. I believe in merit and character over race. But now it's cool to say that white males have done all the bad things in the world. I have two little boys. I get angry just thinking about people telling them they're responsible for racism and sexism. Beautiful little children who just dance in the kitchen and smile. So that's not a shared goal. Here's the third example. People can differ about how many legal immigrants America should allow into the country. But when it comes to whether America should have open borders, well, there's no shared goal there. A country with open borders ceases to be a distinct country. And I want America to remain America. All these ideas, and I could give you a dozen more, are coming from the left. They want to turn the history of Western civilization, of America, a history I'm very proud of, into a highlight reel of human errors. These ideas threaten everything I cherish, my family, my community, my country. And what does the left offer in its place? Nothing constructive that I can see. What are their goals? Kids with no clear sexual identity? Group think based on race, gender, class, no national pride or borders. Are you okay with that? My issue is not with liberals like my brother and my dad and a lot of my friends. We can argue until the cows come home. My issue is with the left because we don't share goals. This war of goals isn't coming, it's here. You need to decide which side you're on, the liberals and conservative side or the lefts. Your future depends on it. I'm Owen Benjamin for Prager University. 
From a February 4th posting on PragerU, that was actually a really great presentation by Owen Benjamin, someone whose voice we've included on our own past broadcasts. He's also one of those online content providers I earlier cited as being identified essentially on the right. And it was very fitting that his comments related to disagreements among people who share goals, but perhaps not the same means to reach those goals. Because as you might recall, if you've been a long-time listener, I found myself both in agreement and in disagreement with Benjamin on those past broadcasts of Just Right. This time I pretty much agreed with most of what he said. It was all very consistent with our own left and right analysis earlier, except for one critical detail. Did you notice what was missing? He clearly mentioned the left, and he explicitly mentioned liberals and conservatives, But where was the right? Hello? What happened? Could it be that those on the right are still feeling handicapped and ashamed for possibly being labeled right-wing? Remember, on the traditional and very wrong left and right scale, fascism has been placed on the right, even though, as a political ideology of tyranny, it belongs on the left. And on that scale, there is no place for something that we could call freedom or capitalism, and it sure isn't in the middle of the road between two forms of tyranny. That's ridiculous. Quote, you need to decide which side you're on, the liberal and conservative side or the lefts, suggests Benjamin, clearly polarizing our choice between two and only two options. But wait a minute, didn't he say a third party entered the game? Yes, he said that, but no, it never did. The left was always there. And like it or not, there are plenty of leftists in both the liberal, the left wing, and in the conservative, the right wing, camp. Hence, our own caution about being labeled right wing ourselves. The left represents socialism. And yes, you can have liberal socialists and conservative socialists. Two wings on the same bird. In most ways, the terms left and right are to politics what the terms good and evil are to morality. They are polar opposites. And, you know, people don't use the word evil anymore these days, mostly because that term has been monopolized by religion for so long, and what was once considered evil on religious grounds has since been discovered perhaps to be the good, like personal pleasure, like individualism, like freedom itself. Good and evil are polarized concepts, just like left and right. There's no middle of the road. There's no centrist position when it comes to good and evil. And until that polarization is recognized in its proper light, we are doomed, as Josh suggested earlier in the show, to darkened days ahead. Why? Because if we only recognize the left as evil and do not recognize the right as being the good, then the only choice available to us is to try and run away from the evil, but never knowing what to run towards. And that's the right. And that's why this show is called Just Right and nothing else. Now, interestingly, notice the role of the adjective in the term just right. It does not mean not right, but quite the opposite. It means only right which would be an otherwise unnecessary adjective, but made necessary by all the other misleading wings and alts and other popular descriptors of the right that prevent us from seeing the light that is the right. And that's why we call this show Just Right. And that's just one more reason to offer your financial support to Just Right and to join us again next week when we will continue our journey in the right direction. And until then... Be right, stay right, do right, act right, think right, and be right back here. We'll see you then. Fade into color, color into black and white. Under the bedclothes, everything will be all right. Now, Colonel, this is probably the first time you ever had a psychiatric examination, right? Wrong. Wrong. Right. Right. Left. <laughs> Please. Thank you. <laughs> Colonel, me. <laughs>